So welcome everybody. Um, today we have the amazing Dr. Troy Hicks and the wonderful intelligent Shailen Farnsworth. Uh, this is going to be literacy in a time of rapid change, strategies and resources for virtual learning. Um, some of you may be familiar experts in virtual learning. I know we are, many of us are brand new. Um, I hope that everybody can today come away with strategies, resources, tips, communities, and we can also support each other by sharing those things in chat. Um, and so let's let's get going. Um, we EdWeb also has a brand new online learning community that you can join. Um, this is also where you can take the CE quiz. There will be CE credits available for this webinar. Um, I think this is going to be a really amazing community. I hope you all join it. I am Tess. I am from Writable. We are sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, a little bit about Writable. It's a research-backed award-winning writing program that supports over 6,000 schools and districts to save teachers time and grow great writers faster. Um, Writable can be used for in-person person and virtual instruction. We have been supporting virtual schools as well as in-person schools for a long time now. So we're really excited to have made our product free for the rest of the school year. We are available for writing practice for assessments, for facilitating effective feedback strategies across disciplines, and for communicating with your students. And uh, we also have a brand new landing page for just virtual learning and writable. Uh, and we've also started something called Project Write Together. This is a way for your students to write um, and then be paired with students around the globe uh, to do anonymous peer review. This is a really great activity if you want your students engaged in writing and perhaps you don't have the time or energy to um, give feedback and grade throughout all of them, um, you can go to writable.com slash virtual learning. If you go one back for a sec, uh, Shaylin. Um, so again, Writable is totally free for the rest of the school year. We also did an EL EdWeb webinar last week that was on virtual instruction for EL students. I hope everybody checks that out if you're supporting EL students. Um, Writable specifically for virtual learning integrates with your LMS and Google Classroom and Docs. We have hundreds and hundreds of assignments and prompts. Um, this is really great if you don't have virtual curriculum already created. You can monitor the growth of your students so that you can intervene and provide feedback. Uh, and we actually guide feedback and communication so that it can be targeted and effective. Um, again, there's our project Write Together, uh, which might is a really great uh, global project for students to participate in right now. Writable is used for grade levels 3 through 12 or whenever students start typing. It can really also be used for higher ed as well, but our content is um, primarily for three through 12. And let's introduce the wonderful Troy and Shaylin. So Troy Hicks is a professor of English and education at Central Michigan University. He directs both the Chippewa River Writing Project and the Master of Arts in Learning Design and Technology program. He is a former middle school teacher. He collaborates with his K-12 colleagues on how they implement newer literacies in their classroom. In 2011, he was honored with CMU's Provost Award for Junior Faculty, who demonstrates outstanding achievement in research and creative activity. In 2014, he received the Conference on English Education's Richard A. Mead Award for Scholarship in English Education. And in 2018, he received the Michigan Reading Association's Teacher Educator Award, an ISTE certified educator. He has authored numerous books, articles, chapters, blog posts, resources uh, related to the teaching of literacy in a digital age. Troy has also taught many virtual classes online. And uh, Troy and Shaylin both right now are facilitating home learning for their children. Um, so they are all in this with you. Um, Shaylin, again, is a coach, a consultant, an educator for Web20 Classroom, if you're familiar with them. They're amazing. She is a leader in the convergence between literacy and technology. As a high school teacher, she redefined her English classroom not only as a place to learn about literature, but also explore how technology is shaping the future of communications. She continues this exploration in her role as a consultant, focusing on technology, literacy, differentiation, and systemic change. 
She is a staff developer, a literacy coach. She supports districts and implementation of initiatives. She is a Microsoft expert, Google certified innovator, Apple teacher, training in project-based learning with the Buck Institute, visible learning with Hattie, instructional coaching, and K-12 literacy best practices. So these are some pretty amazing experts that are really focusing at the center of digital literacy and technology, which is really what um, we have to harness here when we're talking about teaching in the virtual classroom. So take it away, Troy and Shaylin. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to listen to this. That's right. I am so excited too. And I'm sure, um, <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, Troy would echo the same statement. We had so much fun planning for this webinar. We could go on for hours and hours of different resources and tips and things we have we have um, learned throughout the years. The bit.ly for the slides is at the um, bottom of the screen. Uh, and I know Andy and Heidi and Tess are dropping in the resource document, which also includes the slide deck as well. Um, so we want you to have these resources. Troy and I are very giving when it comes to uh, knowledge in these areas. It's, it's our passion. Um, I've said this before. I actually use Use Troy's resources when I was going through my graduate studies. I cited him, and now to be, you know, a colleague and learning with him daily and and hearing his greatness, I'm just in awe. So I'm excited to be here with Troy. Thank you to Writable. We we both appreciate um, the pedagogy that goes behind Writable. That's why we said yes, we are going to do this um, for you guys because it is perfect, especially for everybody's time and needs right now. Um, so what we have on the agenda, first, we're going to take a little bit about we can do this together. As Tess said, we both have children at home. I have two. Troy, how many do you have doing school? Blend, blended family of five teenagers at home right now. <laughs> five teens, and they all want the access right now. Even though dad's on a webinar with all of you guys, um, they all they all want that they all want that web access. We totally understand, um, but we want to talk a little bit about we can do this together, and that's kind of the theme of writable, and, and I love it. So I said, let's start with that. Um, we're going to talk about presence relationships, how can you build and maintain that online. Troy's going to give you some suggestions. I will as well. Teaching and learning feedback. Um, so what pedagogically goes into teaching and learning online? What do we know? What have we learned? Where are the jumping off points? And then resources and communities that you guys can explore. Questions at the end. But I'll tell you, Troy likes to share and talk. So we might not get a lot of questions at the end. Oh, we'll, we'll see. I've been told not to monitor the chat room and uh, Andy and Heidi are going to do a good job of curating questions for us. So That's right. So um, <clears throat> we do want to make sure that all uh, chat participation is uh, streamlined to maybe a question that we pose or uh, a question that you have put in the Q&As because they did tell us a web said that they've had um, problems with this crashing. So we wanna make sure that we streamline this. Um, and I'm just gonna move this right along because I'm gonna have Tess give us some answers and results. I am seeing so many yeses. So it looks like everybody is either preparing to teach until the end of the school year or unsure. I'm not seeing any no's. So I think we are all in the same boat here together. That's right. So Troy, we can do this together. Be kind. Be kind to yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of your kids. Take care of your students. Stay well. Yeah, I think those are all good pieces of advice. And we were kind of joking the other day as we prepped for this, but uh, this is pretty important. And I don't mean to be the wet kit, but we are putting together this webinar. And it is useful, I think, to say in these moments that we are right now that it is Wednesday, March 25th, 2020, in the <laughs> late afternoon on the East Coast. Things could again be different tomorrow. We could get new guidance from the Federal Department of Education. Our state departments of education could be different. Um, we know that a lot of what we're going to share here is FERPA and COPA compliant. Uh, a lot of it adheres to the student privacy pledge, but not all of it, because when we were putting all these resources together, uh, like Shaylin said, we're just trying to take many of the things that we've tried and, and share as many literacy-rich activities for you. 
um, a few things. Um, we know that equity matters and we know that there are both ethical and legal reasons for why that matters. And we want to emulate good practices for you. Um, but we can't say that every single thing we're suggesting today is going to adhere to every um, compliance issue. So just be right. noting that. And what Troy just said, things changed quickly. And I did um, add, because this came across today, being shared by the amazing Dr. David E. Kirkland. Um, he put, so if you access the document being shared, there's a guidance document from NYU on culturally responsive, sustaining remote education. So that's a new one. Um, and, and we'll add those things to the document as well. Exactly. And then the other piece of this context is that for many of you, um, you may be uh, due to district and state guidelines, you may be in a remote situation of teaching right now. You may have been told you are not to do remote teaching and only enrichment. Um, we know that that could change again tomorrow as well. Um, there are a few other kind of caveats and, and notes here. Um, virtual teaching is not new, but virtual teaching in a pandemic is. And with that in mind, I think you're going to hear a theme echoed um, in these slides and based on uh, what you just heard from Shaylin a few moments ago, we want you to be safe. We want you to take care. We want you to be kind. We want you to stay well. And so at the core of all that we're talking about today are thinking about how to build relationships with students. Yeah, and, and exactly what you said, there's lots of research out there on literacy. There's lots of research on there on online teaching. There is very little research, if any yet, on how to transition in two days from face-to-face -face traditional classroom to online resources automatically in a virtual environment. And so, uh, yes, we, we reference different research. We share different things. Um, but some of these things, Troy and I and, and some of our colleagues out there sharing good stuff online, it's in their professional opinions. And so just keep that in mind, as Troy said. We're trying the best that we can and everyone everywhere and we just want you guys to take care of each other and also our, our kids because the number one component of learning is the teacher yes even online even in a virtual space the teacher is irreplaceable I don't know about you but I've had lots of kids who are a plus students face to face get the opportunity to take an online course and fail miserably. And so what it takes is a, is a caring teacher who knows how to interact with students to keep them engaged, build those relationships, maintain those relationships. Teachers cannot be replaced or else they would have a long time ago. Troy? Yeah, and Andy has shared a message from the chat room. Do we think that students in younger grades will be able to synthesize what they're learning? Something I'll say now, you'll probably hear me say it again, we have to move more from the consumption of materials to the needle going over to the creation of materials. And I think that whether you're talking about first graders or fifth graders or 12th graders or graduate students, um, we can't just keep throwing materials at students. We have to invite them to create and compose and produce. Um, and we'll get through that. We'll get back to that throughout the, the conversation today. In terms of self-care, again, we've already kind of hit on a few of these things, but um, yes, patience and forgiveness. Those have been my mantras for the last week. I'm sure they will be for the weeks to come. We want you to ensure that you're taking care of yourself and maintaining those relationships. That's right. And so we want to know, how are you personally advocating for yourselves, giving yourself self-care? Um, what sort of resources, links, apps, podcasts? Are you finding anything helpful right now? Maybe it's a, I've seen a reach out to three and then three more each day. Colleagues, have you seen that Troy and Tess online that you haven't connected with um, lately? Just to check in with them. Um, so what sort of things are you finding to help your own sanity, to maintain your own mental health, to be an advocate for yourself, self-care, so that we can then not only care for our families, but also all of our kids and all of our students that we're missing right now as well. Troy, any favorites that you have? Uh, that idea of just getting out and getting a walk, a little exercise is what's doing it for me, for sure. So. Uh, another question that got curated from the chat, are we going to specifically talk about copyright law? I 
don't know that we'll specifically talk about it, but we'll try to weave that into the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we included that step on there. We're going to talk a little bit about media and information literacy, copyright. That could take a whole uh, another webinar. Lots of great ideas. I'm having my kids and me personally journal as well um, for a little me mental health break. But I love this quote by Edgetopia. Um, you found this one, Troy? Yes. So this was an article um, Ollie Corby wrote. I think it, it dates back just a couple of years, but it was about a middle school where teachers were doing that intentional check in with students. And then they had like all the students names up in an office space and they were like literally putting check marks on the wall to ensure that that kid had been talked to or seen or and heard by an adult that week. And mm -hmm. I think these, this is where we're going right now in this online space. And this is what some of these first slides are about. How is it that we are going to do these intentional check-ins and we're going to share some of our experiences um, as virtual teachers. So um, for me, uh, one of the things that I kind of keep in my mind as a mantra, and again, I'm dealing with adult learners here. Um, I might even up this a little bit if I were dealing with um, younger students, uh, and that is the once a week outreach. And I think of it as a one to many and then a one to one. I do regular announcements. They come out every Sunday in my virtual classes. And then throughout the week, I either try to give them uh, feedback on an assignment, uh, send them an email, message them through Boxer. I try to make sure I get at least a, a, a once a week outreach, uh, personal communication with students. I also have taken to setting up an appointment calendar uh, rather than dealing with the you know two dozen emails of can you meet here, can you meet there, all those types of things. Um, I paid the subscription fee and I've just uh, never looked back. I've been so happy to have that appointment calendar. It helps me plan the chunks of my weeks and when I can talk to students. And again, a lot of those are available in a freemium model. You don't necessarily have to subscribe. And then last but not least, um, uh, asking questions in the margins. That is, I pretty much require my students to turn in everything either as an editable Google Doc uh, or in an Office 365 doc. And that allows me to then tag them and comment. And I, then I get the email notifications and I can chat with them right there in their assignments as well. So mine's a little bit different. Um, uh, I have a K-12 experience and then I have a couple kids at home right now. And so when I was approaching this, I thought about what sort of things can kids do? Um, either online socially, maybe in a Zoom conference, maybe it looks slightly different for our uh, our youngest learners at the, at the elementary grades. Um, but I think it's important for all kids to be heard and seen during this time. I know teachers are doing fantastic things and we're gonna get into that later on in this webinar. But I personally like letting kids voices be heard at the very beginning. So what sort of non-cheesy, because I'm not an icebreaker person, don't give me an icebreaker because I won't do it. Um, but what sort of things can you share at the beginning that gives everybody something to talk about, every everyone a, a voice and, and just a simple check-in? Um, so I was thinking about celebrations. What can they celebrate? Um, what's positive in their life right now? Noticing. Now this was a big one. What to know? Notice they're used to being in school for most of the day. Now that they're home, what do they notice their dogs doing, going on in the neighborhood, their parents doing, their caregivers doing? So what are their no noticings? Easy. Take a shelfie. Um, and that's where you take uh, your book that you're reading and you take an image. And I'm going to grab this one. Here we go. Stephen King on writing. So you take a shelfie and uh, people can post it. So maybe it's not verbal, but maybe it's just an image. You don't want to um, share your face on screen. Here you go. Here's your shelfie. This is what the high schoolers will do, um, right? Or what have you learned? So what besides school have you learned? Maybe it's cooking something new. Um, maybe it's something independent. And I really like this one. And, and I, I, uh, this is very important because I have a middle schooler and a high schooler right now. What are they doing for their own sanity and own self-care? Um, because like you said, uh, social media connects them. 
um, and they're being inundated with all sorts of references and articles and things that they're um, hearing and seeing and and they don't know if it's all true or half truths or, or what's going on. So what are they doing for their own self-care? And I never noticed how important this was, but my son, he's of driving age. Um, so he's used to being socially connecting with kids. Um, it's a little bit different now, but as soon as my daughter realized that they could use different outlets to connect, they'll just be sitting there having lunch together, you know, talking and playing Roblox. I don't know if you guys know what Roblox are, but that's huge in the middle school world right now. And it just, it, even if it's, you know, something simple as a phone call or a letter, just to connect them, it was really important for my daughter at that middle school age that, you know, five through eight, it was important for her to, to have those social connections. Whew, that was a lot. Those are all listed. Troy's and mine are listed on that document. Um, so building relationships virtually, maintaining them. Troy, thoughts on that? Yeah. So, well, one thing I think it's really interesting. I've seen my daughter doing that this week too, where different virtual tools are used in different ways. FaceTime is used to connect with grandparents through iOS devices. Zoom was used to facilitate a meeting with some other kids. Snapchat and Instagram, you know, the video chat are used for those highly personal connections. So it's interesting to see them use their one device, but use multiple apps. And like you were just saying, uh, to build off of everything Shaylin was just saying in the previous slide, um, how do we do this? What are these connections? What are the ways that we can do it? Well, as we think broadly about literacy, we're always thinking about text, we're thinking about images, and then we're thinking about media. So through words, of course, we can do, um, you know, some very quick little things, sending out little messages, interchanging that way. Uh, we can have a little bit longer announcement, maybe a paragraph or two, uh, contribute to a class discussion. Um, and then longer, we can also, you know, every week, hey, here's an update, here's what I did, even if it's just compiling the announcements from the week before. Um, in image, uh, those shelfies are great. Um, take pictures of other things, the activities that you're doing, of your family. And again, this is an interesting digital citizenship moment to have those conversations about when it's appropriate and who does or doesn't want to have their pictures shared. Um, but then they could also share images that they found online. If it's appropriate and useful, you could even invite them to create memes. We all need a little bit of levity at this time. And then last but not least, what are the ways that we can share audio and video and other media. Of course, you can record and share yourself. Um, and I think those things are always incredibly useful. My uh, kids uh, at the high school, one of their teachers has taken doing daily video announcements, and he follows the same format as the traditional announcements. But of course, it's all kind of, you know, tongue in cheek and a little bit uh, fun for the kids right now. And then um, as we kind of think about some other things, you know, if you're looking for something to just push out to your kids and share, uh, you know, for my wife and I, especially like each day, we try to send an article, a podcast, an infographic, something to our kids. Sometimes it's serious, like we really do want an update on what's going on right now. Sometimes there's a little more uh, joy and humor in it. But here are just a few places where you can find some free content uh, to push out to your kids uh, for reading with Tween Tribune or Wonderopolis, uh, video clips from The Kids Should See This, uh, Wow in the World is back to five days a week of production, so podcasts are coming out regularly. And if you really want to get them into, um, you know, moving uh, toward uh, something else, or you just want to prompt discussion, whether you have them write or not, you can take one of these uh, writable prompts, and that can open up some conversation between you and your kids as well. That's right. And like Troy said at the very beginning, we understand um, that this was a a pivot with very little warning. We understand that across the nation, our students um, uh, have different equity, accessibility, ages. We, although love ed tech, we are very much in favor of doing both digital and analog. Um, so simple things such as a letter, or um, I've seen teachers mail some um, fun little activities that they can do at home. Maybe it's cards or dice, or maybe it's just a simple phone call. Um, just anything to to build that connection. I'll tell you in Iowa, um, in, 
and I'm sure it's similar in other places, all of this stuff that they're doing is not required. Um, and you know what? My kids still get on there, I think, for the social interactions um, and not so much for the for the uh, required um, teaching and learning. Um, so just anything, my my um, elementary nieces and nephews have little packets of different fun activities where they can cut things out and paste things, play, um, you know, supports literacy learning in both reading and writing. And so don't um, discourage that and encourage, you know, parents and caregivers that play, you know, restaurant play and, and all the things that our, our youngest learners do, those, all those things encourage literacy learning. So um, while there's no perfect situation, we do want you to know that we are we are literacy first and we we totally support analog and digital. And plus, um, like uh, Tess, I'm sure is just waiting to tell you, Writable can also be downloaded PDF and so they can actually physically write on it as well. So you can customize the assignments and, and send them home with a little uh, something to read and, and write it on out. So Test. Absolutely. You can fully print you your PDFs. You can print out your readings. Um, so if a student doesn't necessarily have the ability to write in Writable, obviously you wouldn't get some of the digital features. Um, but you can also have students do some work on their mobile phones, um, which right now as an accessibility issue might be what your option is. That's right. So now we're moving into the next portion, which is teaching, learning, and feedback strategies for literacy and educators. Starting again with um, a, a fabulous quote, Troy from BTE, National Council of Teachers of English, that we both support. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So last year, they updated their definition of 21st century literacies. And I'm going to do the bad PowerPoint thing and actually read this one because I think it's pretty important. What they say is that the world demands that a literate person possess and intentionally apply a wide range of skills, competencies, and dispositions. These literacies are interconnected, dynamic, and malleable. And mm -hmm. again, noting where we're at right now, the way that you are teaching literacy or not teaching literacy, whether it's enrichment or whether it's going to be more formal and remote learning, we are trying to share with you a number of tools and techniques and strategies uh, that could hopefully be useful for you and your students in whatever your teaching and learning context might be. That's right. I know Andy and Heidi are dropping in the link, but if you're just joining us, there's the link to the handout with the resources. We've tried to organize them. Um, Troy just passed over a whole list of like thousands of them. Uh, so they are organized uh, slightly, but we will be adding to them. And I know Andy is going to add some things if people are asking about it or referencing them. But those people that are watching after the fact, you can get those resources right there. Um, so provide an access and variety. What do we hear, Troy, for reading? <laughs> Well, one of the things that I know to be true is that it's really hard, I mean, to get kids, you know, there's a difference between walking over to the bookshelf and saying, oh, here, you need to read this, and then providing them a link. And yet, at the same time, this is kind of where we're at right now. We have so many resources available, and, and in most cases, that is quite literally all we can do is say, here is a link. And so we wanted to just provide you with a quick overview of some of our uh, favorite resources. Uh, some of these can do leveled text. Um, some of them are more appropriate for elementary, some for secondary. Some have classic works of literature that are available in the public domain. And some, like through your state's electronic library, you may be able to help your students get the latest and greatest young adult fiction or graphic novels all delivered online. So I really think that um, it's important, um, even though we don't have the physical bookshelf in our rooms, to go over and grab something and hand it to students. Um, we want to give them that virtual experience. That's right. So, of course, um, Tess just told you that Writable, you can print and share things. They have a, a and it's linked in the document, Response to Reading. And um, they already have paired text with writing prompts that you can um, print or have kids print off. And they could do that analog or digitally. Um, so those are, are perfect. And somebody said the other day, this is exactly what I was looking for. Newzella, we got to love those guys. Um, I know that they're um, some of Writable's favorite friends. And Newzella is great because they offer texts 
um, that uh, is relevant, high quality nonfiction that is able to differentiate. So they take the text and differentiate the text. Um, Troy, they don't change the image. So it, it, it helps with that, those accessibility issues and it comes with questions, vocabulary, that sort of thing. I love um, Wonderopolis. I love Wonderopolis. It's just visually appealing. It's great for our youngest learners. What about you, Troy? Yeah, I've had the good fortune of being able to work with the Wonderopolis team, and I've seen teachers um, use Wonderopolis as te templates that they then have their own students design the, a Wonderopolis style article. Mm -hmm. Highly accessible, and even for older readers, sometimes having them write in that style helps them think about nonfiction being accessible and even a little bit of fun and humor in their nonfiction writing. I should mention that all of the readings that you find, you can put into Writable. So if you find a reading that you love and you want to add it to a Writable assignment or make your own, that's available too. So Writable is really a repository for any of the content that you find outside of Writable that you might also be wanting to use. That's right. Um, and I, I know I have been, I'm a collector. Troy, I collect different lists. If you are looking for something specific in the nonfiction area for all the way K, all the way up to 12, um, click on that Symbaloo link. I have it um, organized in a Symbaloo where I've been curating links throughout the year. Lots of um, different choices in there for our youngest learners all the way up to, to 12th graders. Um, but we did want to talk about reading me media literacy and informational literacy. Why is this important, Troy? Oh, I, I feel like I've said now more than ever, more than ever in the last week or two, but um, <laughs> media literacy is absolutely uh, essential in these moments. And I'm not going to devolve into any further political conversation except to say that we know we're getting information from a variety of sources. Uh, some of those sources um, are using different forms of evidence and different persuasive techniques. And uh, in a moment where it is quite literally life and death, uh, we need to take this especially seriously. So um, the resources that Shaylin and I tried to put together here are a few that we have found to be credible and useful and all promote discourse not just a right or wrong, this or that type of thinking. Uh, one more I'll say out loud, and maybe someone can toss in the chat, would be uh, Kialo uh, that introduces debates in a really thoughtful, dialogic manner. And so All Sides, the News Literacy Project, KQED has tremendous resources, PolitiFact, Snopes, um, any place that you can get um, your students to be looking and digging and thinking a little bit deeper about these current events. That's right, and it's very relevant and engaging to online learning. Um, and I know a lot of our social studies friends, and even um, my my uh, Grace Anne's middle school teacher has them um, talk about read and think and write an article a week um, that they choose. And so. Uh, developing careful discerners of information is essential and something like this would be fun to explore. Um, I put a couple blog links in there, uh, some games you could use in your classroom, um, some different things to think through. So you'll see some of my blog posts in there as well. Um, just because Troy and I write a lot about these things, so we share them on our on our blogs as well. So we're not only giving you different resources, but also some context um, that people can find as well. So huge um, media literacy and informational literacy, extremely important, especially um, not only with text, but images and videos and deep fakes and everything out there um, that would be relevant and engaging to kids right now to boost those literacy skills. All right, what about starting, uh, getting started on writing online? Um, we're used to going through that process, uh, you know, working with our kids side by side. So what should we do when we're starting out online? Well, here's what I think we know about good writing instruction is that we're not trying to do full 45 and 50 minute lectures about here's how you write a thesis statement. We do a quick mini lesson and then we point kids to a mentor text and say, let's look at how this other writer has done this work or how they've added a quote or how they've made a transition. 
Um, and my friend and colleague who's in the chat room, Andy, and I talk about this in our upcoming book, uh, Creating Confident Writers, this notion that mentor texts are absolutely essential for young kids, for older kids, for my graduate students. We're always sharing mentor texts and saying, how did this other author do this? So these are just some sources and some ways um, to find mentor texts and some good thoughtful prompts uh, that will lead to some engaging writing. Um, and in particular, in addition to Writable, I'll definitely give a shout out to the New York Times, who has released a full writing curriculum this year, and they are now releasing daily writing prompts uh, for students as well. That's right. And um, I love how you say start small, um, you know, uh, diving into um, content right now might not be appropriate. It might be a week or two down the road. Um, but you could set it up just as Troy said, being synchronous or asynchronous. Um, it could be a short, uh, mini lesson that you record. Maybe for our youngest learners, it is you doing a read aloud and then talking about a specific page, um, to really work on those language skills and, and developing those writers. Um, so there are ways that you can do it. Um, and there are perfect ways to marriage that writing process in a virtual world. And what does that look like? Um, uh, I agree with all of those things that you just said, Troy. Oh, sorry. We, we have just that slightest bit of lag. I'm so sorry. I'm talking over top of you. I would just say, I think modeling that writing process, whether you're doing it in a word processor or you hook up your smartphone and use it as a document cam and you are actually literally writing on paper, Show kids your writing when you create those screencasts and record those mini lessons. That's right. And I love, and I put that on there, um, don't forget the share. So everything that they do may not become um, publishable state. It may be something that they jot in their journal. It may be something um, that they create a visual about. But having that option to share with a partner, share with a parent, um, post somewhere, maybe it's in a, um, you know, an analog or a digital journal, whatever it may be be keeping those little little nuggets in and uh, sharing those with others is extremely important in the writing process as well. Um, speaking, we know that that's extremely important to not only develop those early uh, literacy skills, um, but also to hone that um, as they uh, progress throughout the grades and, and move to college or career. We need to hone the speaking skills in this digital world. So what are some things people can do, Troy? Well, again, we could go into so much detail on all these different strategies for teaching speaking, um, and I wish we could. But for the moment, just to mention that here are some great tools that we've tried. Um, people are probably familiar with some of them. If you're not, we have the links for you to check them out. Flipgrid, Voxer, Vocaroo, and GoSynth are ways that we can invite students to share their voice. Again, quite literally share their voice, not just their words on the screen, but their actual um, voice and get the feedback uh, from the teacher in voice as well, which can be particularly powerful. That's right. And you can make those um, Flipgrids be uh, whole class or I've worked with elementary teachers and they had each student had a grid that they used for fluency progression. Um, they were elementary, but they used that to track their fluency throughout. So it could be an individual grid for, for a student where they could read aloud, um, you know, once or twice a week for let's say five to 10 minutes. And it could be a progression of their fluency um, because we all know fluency is not all about rate, right? Um, so Flipgrid, a beautiful collection of a student's progression throughout the year. Boxer, a lot of people don't know that. It's a higher ed thing, I think. I tried to use it at the high school level. It just, it, I don't know. Um, but it's a great way to connect with other educators. There's active groups of educators on Boxer. And GoSynth, I love it. If you have not used GoSynth, and it's perfect way. It's like bite-sized chunks um, of podcasts or voice recordings. So um, a lot of the older kids, they're tired of using Flipgrid, tired of shooting videos. They just want to speak. GoSynth is perfect. You can have those threaded discussions in a podcast form. Um, so lots of different ways that you can encourage speaking um, in this virtual and, and online instructional period. What about listening, Troy? 
Well, in addition to obviously having the listening that would go back and forth during these speaking activities, some more formal listening opportunities might be through audio books that you can get through Audible, LibriVox, or again, your state electronic library or your local electronic library has ebooks and uh, audio books you can access. And uh, ListenWise, which brings in NPR content and then puts it into uh, context and gives re uh, listeners some options to engage with quizzes and other um, types of activities around those stories is a really good opportunity for more formal listening too. And I love that. And I just want to re-echo, Audible stories are free right now. They're free. Um, so that's a great way. Uh, and there's there's lots of research out there about brain and and is hearing hearing stories cheating and and we're not talking to youngest learners when they're working on foundational skills, but listening to a story and comprehending it and talking about it is not cheating. The same sort of brain activity is taking place and um, as if you're visually reading it. Um, so it's definitely an option. It gives kids availability to more text, more experience, and it's free right now. And I love it. I'm so excited. And it visually looks beautiful. And ah, anyway. <laughs> Wonderful. And so the next two slides, and we have the links, of course, in the shared doc, so I'm going to go quickly, is just this idea of both viewing, so consuming the visual information, but then also visually representing and creating that information. Number of different resources here. Again, Shaylin, we can just kind of hold that on screen for a second and then move to the next slide. The links are available. But again, in this moment where kids have opportunities to be consuming lots of media and also then potentially creating their own and sharing it and breaking out of the school mode and the required standards and benchmarks and allowing them to create enrichment types of opportunities, we might as well help them become more visual learners. So I just like these tools for viewing and visually representing. All right, what about that engaging with video at the bottom, favorite tool? Um, right now, I would say that uh, now comment is the tool I prefer because you can embed YouTube videos and then you can also put text in there as well and have basically threaded discussion around those videos and images and text. And it's a completely free tool. Um, and the developer, Paul Ellison, is committed to keeping it free as well. I love that. Um, so designing resources, we've also put some things for not only you, but your students. Um, when the time comes to think about, all right, now that I have online teaching completely under control, uh -huh, um, I can start working on visually designing and, and uh, not only talk about images, but creating them and uh, students creating them as well. So we put some design resources as well in there um, if you are ready to start exploring those different avenues. I love Adobe Spark for education. Um, and I know Tess loves Canva and she has me hooked on that too, but it just helps you create something visual. So if I had to create these slides, they would just be white generic slides with black text. Um, Adobe Spark for education, Canva, all of those things offer tools um, with pre-built templates. They make things uh, uh, easy. So here we're trying to shift over to thinking a little bit more about teaching and instructional design and making sure that we're being very intentional with the activities that we're leading. Um, one of the things that I'm very fearful of is the fact that very poor teaching face-to-face -face is even worse teaching online. And if all we're doing is lecturing at students, expecting that they're going to read the book and then taking the quiz on Friday, um, that is not going to be a good instructional design model online either. So I know we're, we're just coming up so quickly at the top of the hour. We have kind of a whole segment in here where we wanted to talk about uh, tools and uh, ideas related to instructional design. I think what I'll let you do, Shaylin, is kind of take it for just a moment and hit the highlights over the next couple slides so we can then um, move on and talk about teacher and student communities and where people can stay connected over the next few weeks and months. That's right. So I'm going to zoom through these. Um, I firmly believe, it, just like in the classroom, when you're designing lessons um, for online or virtual remote learning, you need to have it relevant. 
you need to provide some student choice and you need to differentiate. And I'm calling upon Carol Ann Tomlinson there. I've linked inside the document. This is an example of a choice board. It has different levels of learning. So learning, digging deeper, applying. This is a um, periodic table. But you can blend both videos, music, um, and it's all hyperlinked, kind of like a hyperdoc. So students might have the same end goal, um, but they can just use their own choices as they nav navigate through this lesson and unit um, based on their personal preferences. I love choice boards and there's a, a free blank choice board in there for you as well. I also think it's important when you think about active learning um, for online instruction, you talk about learner content, learner instructor, learner, learner, and learner technology. So how are you guys having kids not only work with content, kind of like the choice board, how are they interacting with the instructor? Maybe it's face-to-face, -face, maybe it's synchronous, asynchronous. How are they working in small groups or with each other? That's the learner-learner, because that is important as well. And then how are they working with the technology available? Maybe the technology is just a Kindle. Maybe it is... Um, uh, a laptop, so it varies. Um, and, and those sort of interactions and thoughts for you to consider um, are also part of the slide deck, but also part of the downloads. How do they interact in all four of those active learning interactions are extremely important when developing online resources, lessons, units. So people say, how do you do this? How do you have those interactions? What does the research say? What sort of things are out there? Well, Troy and I so you need to chunk activities, make it small, make it digestible, 10 minutes. Um, if you have a large class, don't be afraid to small group it on discussion boards or on a flip grid or um, on a particular document. All kids don't have to be 30 or 50 students on one sort of document or discussion board or flip grid. You can small group it right within there. And don't forget videos, text, visuals to segment them. They can part of a whole. Or maybe um, you have a whole visual and you're going to zoom in on a specific place while you're instructing on a lesson. So think of parts and holes when you chunk it so kids can see a clear picture of how this relates to everything that they're doing and how it makes sense. And people ask, what about the time, Shaylin? What about the time? What about the time? Again, there's lots of research out there for online. There's no research out there for transitioning to online from face to face in a pandemic. These are guesstimates, in my professional opinion. Youngest kids, five to 15 minutes. And that accounts for checking in, saying hello, maybe a small instructional. You don't want the kids all day online. It's absurd um, because I, I was telling my sister, who is not an educator, they don't sit in math class and do 45 minutes of math facts. Don't have them sit all day online, right? Fifth grade through eighth grade, my best guesstimate is about 15 to 20 minutes. And then high schoolers, I think that sweet spot is about 25 to 30 minutes online where they can check in, do any sort of instructional clarification. Um, those are my best guesstimates and, and, and recommendations from what's out there, all the research involved. So videos, and, and I know this is exciting because Tessa has some exciting news for everyone coming up here. When you create videos, they should be short, six minutes or less, six to nine minutes is that sweet spot. They need to be interactive, just like we talked about. And then some of our favorites to create those videos, Troy and I love Screencastify. You could even simply do it on your phone and save it to Google Drive. But this one is very exciting. And I know Tess has been pushing this. And so has Heidi, um, who's in the chat as well. So you'll be able to do videos right within Writable. So you can record a video and instruct them for their writing. Tess? Absolutely. So this is a little preview. In the next week or two, this is going to be live and writable. You are going to have video functionality so that you can record videos, write and writable privately um, and communicate with your students when you can't necessarily see them in the class. Um, so we're really excited to be able to provide that kind of communication in addition to all the other kinds of communication we guide. I'm very excited about this because I think teachers love sharing videos. 
um, with their students. It lets them see. Um, and these are my tips and suggestions when you create them. Kids, it's easy to pull off YouTube videos that are already constructed, but I'll be honest, kids want to see their teacher. They want to see you. Um, even if you are pants on the bottom and a fancy shirt on top and your hair pulled up in a bun, they want to see you. Um, so these are some tips and suggestions, the six to nine minutes of length, have it conversational and it's okay. Forgive yourself just like you would for kids. We are all learning on this. If you need to do a redo, if you have mistakes, it is okay. Differentiation, um, of course, this is perfect for writing because I'm pulling upon Tomlinson here, differentiating according to assessment, content, process, and product. Now, we don't have time to go into all this, but I do want you to know that on the list, Troy and I um, have a resource guide that shares a whole bunch of formative assessment tools. So if you click on that, it gives you tons of different options for assessment. But I love talking about differentiation and feedback. Troy, how do you differentiate? Why does that matter for feedback? Well, absolutely. We want to be able to give students experiences that are going to be meaningful for them. And you can differentiate at different points in the instructional process. And in doing so, we know that it's going to get them more engaged as writers. And they're much more likely to feel good about their writing, to want to share that writing, to give meaningful feedback to other writers who feel the same way about their writing. So different types of feedback? Yeah, so as we're thinking about the many different ways that we can do feedback, we think about how students can do a self-review. We then think about student-to-student -student peer review. We think about the feedback that they can get from machines and what they can learn from grammar checkers and artificial intelligence and originality checking. And then, of course, again, going back to the heart of this conversation today, and even in these difficult times, you matter. The feedback that you give kids, timely, effective, goal-oriented feedback, all these different types of feedback matter. So whether you're doing that through voice, through screencast, through text, um, it matters. And that's what we need to keep in mind is that um, we as teachers have great power in the ways that our words can influence kids and keep them motivated as writers. That's right. Uh -huh. um, Tess, did you want to add some things here? Yeah, I just wanted to show feedback and writable a little bit because we oftentimes talk about feedback in the classroom, um, but the feedback can happen virtually and you can take these uh, pieces of research and you can apply them to a virtual classroom. So I'm just going to uh, open up our file here. I'm just going to show everybody a little bit what it looks like. We call Writable our feedback engine because we think all kinds of feedback are really important, um, whether it's AI, originality checking, anonymous peer review, teacher grading, teacher feedback. We think video feedback is also really important and peer and uh, self-review as well. So this is a little bit of our revision aid. Um, which is AI powered revision recommendations. So this is actually giving students on demand feedback on how to improve their writing in the moment, which can be really helpful if you're not there. Uh, we have Turnitin already inside of Writable 2. If this is something that appeals to you, um, Writable is sort of a one-stop shop in terms of all the tools you need to instruct writing, especially virtually. Um, and then we're going to show you what self-review looks like. Self-review and peer review are very similar. Um, we actually guide it with side-by-side -side rubrics, and we uh, will. you can see when you hover over the rubric items, it's actually going to explain to students what they mean and then pop up comment stems so that they give themselves or other people targeted feedback. We don't think that, and the research doesn't show that feedback is just something you know automatically, right? This is something you actually have to learn. It's a skill. Um, and it's also really important to tie your comments into those rubric items so that students can revise in an organized, um, formal way so that they actually are really improving because the research shows that better feedback and revision are really what drive writing growth. Um, and then we also do this with anonymous peer review. Uh, which is really important that students are not learning only how to give themselves feedback, but others. 
And then we do this with teacher grading as well. So this becomes a virtual stack for you. So you're not opening 40 Google Doc tabs. Uh, and so you really can give that effective feedback, um, the targeted feedback, the tied to your rubric feedback and video feedback as well. So I, I'm going to probably stop this video just a little bit early um, since you can kind of see how our virtual stack is working. Um, but again, Writable is also totally free right now through the end of the school year. Uh, yeah, and I, I know Troy and I, uh, of course, um, we support Writable, um, you know, with this webinar, but we love how it uh, supports the writing process um, and it considers all those different things from feedback to reviewing to grades to rubrics um, to grade less. Uh, so so that is a, a benefit and that's why why we love the team at Writable. Um, so there's lots of different already pre-made um, skills, prompts, and assessments in there, but you can also create and customize your own. And I cannot wait for video. I'm just chomping at the bit there um, to, <laughs> use those, to use those videos. Um, so additional tips and communities and resources. What do you think here, Troy? I think just as a logistical note, um, you're able to hang on here past the top of the hour and I see messages popping up saying thank you. People may want to hang on tight for just a few more moments. I personally am going to step away uh, in just a few minutes. So just logistical there. But to say that, um, you know, as we're thinking about how we um, build our own professional development and maintain community and the importance of maintaining community for kids, we have a few resources that we'd like to share in this next segment. Um, again, as you think broadly about virtual instruction, this particular resource is drawn from Arizona State University, uh, but I found it pretty helpful and I think it can be stretched and used in a couple different ways. So on the next slide, there's an infographic that um, kind of demonstrates different components of what you might need to keep in mind as you're building your online community for kids. Uh, I think that it's important. Uh, we don't have to do it all overnight, but these are things to strive for over time. Um, we're also thinking about how we can stay connected uh, with educators. Um, so if you are on Twitter, awesome. You already know probably lots of these hashtags. Maybe some of them are new to you. If you're new to Twitter, tonight is the night to hop on. I hear there's a Twitter chat coming up very soon. What? what? The Writing matter Twitter chat? The writing on Twitter chat every week, yeah. Wednesdays at four o'clock Pacific, seven o'clock Eastern. We will continue to be talking about remote and distance learning. It is an amazing community. Shaylin is there every week. It is so wonderful. Yeah. And so That's Twitter. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And again, we're, we have so many more resources to share. I'm sorry, we're kind of rushing here at the end. But um, a few Facebook groups that we found um, that are out there, of course, Writable has the Writable Educators group. There are some that have popped up. Um, we were talking about, you know, the tone and style in some of these groups that have popped up. But there are some Facebook groups around this idea of teaching in the era of COVID-19, like pandemic pedagogy. Uh, another particular group that I really like and trust is Common Sense Educators. Uh, I would highly recommend their group on Facebook. And lots of course, of our host for tonight, Ed Webb. That's right. There's lots of different ways that you can connect, not only with um, other educators, but more specific. So if you're looking for elementary educators or EL educators or writing teachers, um, there's tons of different groups out there, not only on Twitter, um, but uh, lots of communities uh, where people are sharing great things. Um, not only do we do that in uh, the, the, ch the Facebook group, um, but we also have things for kids to be involved in. So on the Facebook group, and I know Tess said it at the beginning of the hour, the thing that did it virtually for kids was to be connected with other people outside of their school, outside of their classroom, outside of their regular class. And so uh, this project right together is going to be fantastic. Uh, we'll take care of all the work for you at Writable and we'll partner you with another classroom um, around the same age or grade band, around the same uh, writing type. And you guys can connect together your kids and have them anonymously share feedback 
and peer review based on the stuff that's built within a, a safe platform. So it's a but great also, thing. I, I just want to encourage people because I'm telling yeah. you, that's what I did for my kids. I also think, you know, the, the prompts that we've chosen for Project Write Together are very SEL focused. And I think they are can be cathartic for kids to be writing about these things right now. Um, and so we spend a lot of time and our curriculum team has spent a lot of time very carefully choosing these prompts um, and trying to create a privacy safe, uh, does not violate your privacy policy, global writing project um, that I'm really excited for kids to be part of. We also have other resources out there um, that people are continuously updated. I did want to um, draw attention to that second one, Troy. I know I'm friends with Kristen. Are you friends with Katie? Uh, I, I've only met Katie once. Kristen and I have collaborated on a few other PD projects before. Okay, so they're fantastic elementary educators, and, and they're sharing lots of um, great ideas for online digital environments, so check them out. Um, uh, and all and, these links, again, are in the resource document. Mm. That's right. Lots of different links and groups out there. Um, we just chose some of our favorite ones. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure there's people asking about video and recording and connecting kids. Um, a few things when you're talking about management, and, and we put this towards the end because we didn't know where to put it, is when you look at online learning, you have what's main and what's supplemental. And so a main LMS learning management system would be like Google Classroom or Schoology or Canva or Seesaw. And then you have what's known as supplemental ones that support students inside there. So like Writable, um, a Padlet, Flipgrid, all of those would be supplements to the learning. Now, the thing to remember is, even though we flooded you with tons of resources, and I'm going to throw that blame on, on Troy, um, don't flood uh, teachers and don't flood kids with lots of new tech resources. Um, make sure that they're inoperable, meaning that they can, they have an inoperability, that they can work well together with lots of, um, with what's already in place. Uh, so you don't have to do um, the same thing on multiple platforms. Um, and if you want to, uh, connect with classrooms. Zoom is highly popular. I know they're running a uh, free for use um, for educators. I do know that they've been experiencing difficulties. So we did link that in the resources, how to protect yourself so nobody uh, crashes your Zoom party. Um, Google Meet and Google Hangouts, Loom, WebEx, I also know is, is running a, a free special for educators. So there's lots of different ways if you need that ability reach out. There are ways to connect with kids. My son does uh, PE every other day with his uh, physical education teacher um, right there online. He has them do sit-ups and push-ups. Uh, so there are ways to, to meet and connect with kids, but make sure that they integrate together, um, that they're not running in conflict. And that just reiterates the theme from the top of the call that we know people are adapting and changing quickly. Your districts are adapting and changing. Your tech director, your superintendent may have different advice and recommendations and demands of you. This is a potpourri. We don't even have time. I'm not even going to try. The links are there. Check them all out. <laughs> I, I do want to say something too. If you have questions about interoperability with an ed tech tool, or um, you are curious about the ramifications or the privacy policy or um, how an ed tech tool can support you from somebody who works in ed tech and I was a teacher for many years in the classroom. We're here to support you. This is our job. This is all we wanna be doing right now. Personally, reach out to us, ask us, tell us how we can help you, ask us your questions. Um, I'd speak for Writable, but also every other ed tech company, because I know we all have the same sentiment here. Um, whatever you think that we can do to help, just let us know. Um, lean on us. That's right. I know, Troy, you have to go, but um, I can definitely hang out if there's some questions, Heidi. And I know Andy's on there and Heidi and Tess, uh, you are on there, so we can all join in here. Um, but if there are some questions that are... are uh... If people yeah. want to Yeah, I I am happy to hang out and ask you questions, Shaylin. Um, 
Let's see. How do you gauge the frequency with which you should check in on your students? How much is too much? Yeah. I, I think, you know, um, and I'm sure uh, Troy, Troy would agree with this before he drops off. I think it's a great unknown right now. Um, there is, is no playbook on how to move from Friday from a traditional face to face where they see you all the time to Monday. Now you're on an online virtual, um, you know, environment. Uh, I do think that, uh, some schedules I've seen an eight to three virtual school and that's too much, <laughs> you know, kids, kids can't handle that. Parents can't handle that. What if you have multiple kids in there? Teachers can't handle that because they're trying to teach and parent and run a homeschool. Um, so I, I think, I think it is try to at least touch base with each student once a week whether it's through a letter, whether it's through a phone call, um, whether it's through uh, a chat or a Zoom. Um, I do think, you know, the sweet spot just from what I've seen and, and what I've heard and, and what I've done personally, high school kids, 25 to 30 minutes per subject area. And that is everything, Tess. That is any yeah. sort of, you know, uh, people can't get logged in or time to settle down or attendance or instruction. If you're spending more than 25, 30 minutes for all that stuff for seven or eight periods a day, that, 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 that gets really up. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, younger kids. You don't have to do everything synchronous. It can be asynchronous. Maybe it's just you reading, like I said. Um, but you know, maybe a, a two to two to five minute check in, just like you would for you know one to one conferring, perhaps um, by phone or, or whatnot, would be important to do. Um, let's see. We have a, a question. I think I can answer really quickly is EL resources, and I yeah. did want to point everyone. The best place, honestly, to go is we, Shaylin and Emily Francis and Brett Gosselin, did an EL webinar last week that yes. they so amazingly pivoted to all the virtual resources that you could possibly need for EL students that they are using as they were preparing their classrooms to be online. Um, so if you are supporting EL students, that is on EdWeb. Um, if you just search for Writable, or you search for high impact ELL literacy, I think is what it was called. Um, that was an amazing uh, It was resource. amazing. I loved it. And I just sat back. I kind of moderated one with questions. And Emily and Brett were amazing sharing tons of resources, strategies, frameworks, everything. So they were awesome. And I see Ed Webb just dropped that link in there. Awesome. They had resources I, and Catherine they just dropped it in there so scroll back up to EdWeb and you'll see that link Emily Francis and Brett they they were incredibly um so good. Good. there were two quick writable questions um one was are um checklists and reviews customizable and I did just want to mention every single aspect of writable is customizable your checklists, your readings, your prompts, your directions, your videos, your multiple choice questions. You can take ours. You can use it as a template. You can create your own. There's nothing you can't change. And then the other quick writable question was, how difficult is it to incorporate writable into an already established Google Classroom? Is writable easy to work with and understand for teachers that are less tech savvy? I just want to yell to the rooftops, yes, yes, yes. Writable is a Google for Education partner. We are also partnered with Schoology and Canvas. That means we're deeply integrated with their platforms. We believe that we, you should have interoperability with your supplemental tools, uh, which means easy for you to use and seamless for you to use. So you students don't have to sign into Writable. If you're using Google Classroom, grades and rosters automatically sync. You can assign directly to the stream. Students can write in embedded Google Docs. Everything's shareable by Sheets. Um, so it, whether you use Google Classroom or another LMS, um, it's really seamlessly integrated uh, because we don't think that only tech savvy people should have access to tech, um, especially right now. Uh, but let me ask you another question, Shaylin. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you have uh, e-portfolio recommendations? How, mm -hmm. how would you recommend students are creating portfolios right now? So a couple of things for you to consider, and then I'll tell you how I had my kids do it. Okay. Yes, I think it's very important for kids to have a digital 
portfolio of um, things that they've created, um, things that they've shared uh, that highlights their skills um, that they can take with them when they leave. Um, my kids did one. They started in middle school um, all the way through high school. Now, when I say kids, I mean former students. Um, and uh, so they, we were a one-to-one -one school, so we had that availability. But I'll tell you, um, I learned right away that they needed something that you could both embed um, audio and video, right, for our fine arts students because they wanted to keep all those things. Um, and, and so what we settled on, we were a Google Apps for Education, but we had um, uh, we had Chromebooks and we had Apple devices. Um, we settled on a Google site and a YouTube channel. So they had a Google site and a YouTube channel um, that acted as their portfolio. I really like, um, uh, I think there's one called, um, is it called Bloom's portfolio? Um, I'll have to double check that. Um, oh, but the, here's, the thing, like here's the thing that I want to share with everyone is if you have kids create things underneath a school domain, very few people have an exit plan. So whatever their portfolio is, yes, Blooms, that's right. Whatever their portfolio is, you're going to have to figure out how they can transfer it to a different web address or different ownership once they leave high school. Um, and a lot of people don't think of exit plans when they put all of their data in one place. Um, I, think temporary, you know. I know a lot of people don't maybe think of it that you already have a portfolio, but Google Drive is actually a what a lot of people also use as their portfolio, especially for your older kids um, and keeping things in folders inside of Google drive and having your docs there. Um, yeah. I, I think that's just more of a management. I, I mean, you can put stuff in there and you can have a folder, but like a, a portfolio coming out of a quick case, you usually see like blooms, you usually see like a Google site or a, yeah blog you know you very rarely see somebody say here's my two folders in my google drive you know yeah. um but the exit thing that's the thing to remember is wherever they put it and if you have a folder on google it's very hard to remove a whole folder unless you use google takeout or something like that um but you have to have that exit plan for whatever you use i know you mentioned blogs i was we didn't even touch on it uh, great. I know there's too much. There's too much to talk about. Blogs are are such an amazing um, part of literacy. What are what are your thoughts on on kids writing blogs right now? I love blogs. Um, I think uh, it is a great way to include both. Um, analog and digital. So a lot of, um, I ran a workshop classroom uh, when I taught students um, and not teachers, but um, I think blogs are a way to have a relevant audience, different than traditional lone teacher. It is the one that moved my writers forward most um, when it was somebody else uh, reading their work. And it was a way to, um, you know, we did a lot of uh, nature walks and you know creative things um visually um that you can snap a picture upload it to a blog or a digital portfolio and keep it all in one place i think that it's important for kids to know how all those genres and types fit into the digital world um, and blogging is a good way for them to try what does informational or narrative um, or argumentative look like in a blog post um, and what they see in their digital lives so i think it's a perfect place to experiment. I will tell you, it's easier to do when you have um, connection with another class. So I always connected with two other classes. Um, we didn't necessarily write the same thing, but we all agreed that our kids would comment once a week on each other's. Um, and so we set that up. And if you don't have anybody reading their work and commenting um, and you put it on a, blo a blog, right, um, then what's the point? Uh, and so they really need those comments. So, so being careful about that. Yeah, yeah. I, feedback is is paramount. Whether you're writing a blog or you're writing a journal or poetry or an essay or a quick response, I think getting that feedback from other students and working with those other classes is so helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. final? Yeah. Any any final one? I I think I think we've answered a lot of questions um, that were asked. Uh, I do, uh, there was a, a number of other writable questions. So I did just want to remind everybody, writable is free for the remainder of the school year. Um, 
Writable has always been free for teachers. So I hope it's a resource that everybody can use. I know we continue to hear it's not just tools you need, but it's curriculum and it's content and it's assignments. Um, so I really hope that we can be of some help. We're here to help you. Um, please email us if there's anything that you can think of. Uh, we also have live chat inside of our app uh, where you can talk to us. Um, and just wishing everybody safety and health and um, support during this time. We're going to figure it out together. That's right. And, you know, if you need extra support, like Tess said, um, you can contact Tess. Uh, we have we have different webinars where I, Becky and I are, are doing some other little mini trainings. And so if this was one that your brain just overloaded and exploded and, and you want to do one thing and be an expert at that, let us know because we can help you work through some of those things. Um, uh, so just, you know, take it one step at a time. You don't have to be an expert at everything. Um, we have been in this, you know, ed tech world for a very long time. Um, and so has Troy. Uh, but now we find ourselves all working together to do what's best for kids. We need to take care of each other. We need to take care of ourselves. And yeah, it's just great. I almost want to cry. It's great to be here. I know. Um, I, I so, wish we could yeah, part of that. <laughs> So thank you everybody for attending and for hanging out with us. Um, I know right, right, right Andy. What? Huge shout out to Andy Tess. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Andy and Heidi and also thank you, Troy and Shaylin. But yeah, Andy, who is just the most amazing, thoughtful, resourceful, uh, feels like he shares a brain with Troy. So he has all of those amazing resources. Uh Thank you so much for sharing them in chat and for answering people's questions. Um, we're so thankful. That's right. Thank you, guys.